You know, people often say to me, oh, you were so brave, you changed your career, and that's really not the case. I remember feeling this one a devastation and humiliation, but also thinking, wow, I'm free. I can do whatever I want. I have nothing right now. Why not aim for the stars? And so I did. Hi, I'm Gerard Butler, and this is the timeline of my career. So there are rules, things you do and don't do. All I did was tell the woman how I feel, for God's sake. You don't tell Her Majesty how you feel. So Mrs. Brown came to me at a very interesting period of my life when I had been training as a lawyer. I had been fired one week before qualifying after seven years of my life in law school and training um, where they'd released me and said, we think your dreams lie elsewhere, which they did. And I, the next day, jumped in a car and moved to London and called my mom and said, you know, for all these years, you thought I was going to be a lawyer. Well, it's not happening. I've just been fired. I know it's humiliating, but guess what? It's okay, because I'm going to be an actor. I went down to London and kind of begged and scraped a bit and um, talked my way into an audition for theater, for Shakespeare, actually, and I got the role. And then talked my way into another audition and got the lead role in this play called Trainspotting, which then got me an agent, which was everything. In actual fact, Mrs. Brown was my first audition for any film. And I got a call, I was visiting my family in Scotland saying, hey, you got the role, and I'm like, these people are crazy. What are they thinking? My first day on Mrs. Brown was actually kind of awful. I was terrified and I remember having to run into the bushes to have to pee because there was no toilets there and I was so nervous I couldn't stop peeing. I kept trying to put my costume up and I'm like, oh, I'm, so, I'm still going, oh, I'm still. And it was also so cold and it's the North Sea and it was November and the sea was so foreboding and black and scary. And we knew that at the end of the day, we had to run naked into that ocean. And the whole day they would spray us and pour water on us because we're, we were filming the scene after having been in the ocean, so we're soaking wet. So they soaked our hair, they soaked our bodies. And by four o'clock in the afternoon, we both had, especially me, um, the, the onset of hypothermia and they, they were very worried about us. They had ambulances waiting, they were about to rush me to the hospital. <laughs> it's like that great first day. And little did I know that that would also be what the rest of my career was like. <laughs> There's always something. Night time sharpens, heightens each sensation. I feel like I've spent most of my career feeling like a total imposter. Um, but so there's a part of me has a lot of fear. Um, some of it is super healthy because it pushes me. Um, some of it I could do without because it's just annoying. But what I would always do would be push to try things that neither myself or anybody else would think I could do. So I'd never had a singing lesson in my life. And then I had to sing for Andrew Lloyd Webber. So that was one of the scariest experiences of, of my, I'll never forget it. And Joel Schumacher, God rest his soul. And I love that man. Sitting up at the front with a huge smile on his face because he knew how nervous I was. And Simon, who was playing the piano, started doing this to me as I went to sing. <laughs> and he was telling me to breathe, but I thought he was having a panic attack. And, and I'm like, why is he nervous? I'm, I'm the one having this audition. He's going, <gasps> he's going, <gasps> and I'm like, this, this, he's putting, this, he's putting me off. This is, this is not going to work with Joel at the front like this. And then Andrew Lloyd Webber broke down my singing for about an hour and a half, which is probably amazing to think that he would uh, find so much to say about your voice and every facet of your voice and the different tones. And, um, but me and my insecurity just took it all as criticism. And I walked out of there saying to Joe, he hated me. He doesn't look, he just ripped me apart. And Joe's like, he loved you. The job is yours. 
And, and then I proceeded to um, perform around people that all had pretty much a thousand times more experience than me in singing. And, but no, I loved it because for me it was character first, even the singing. I knew I'm never going to have the voice that they have, but if I can sing with truth. And, and they even taught me that way, which I loved, if your voice breaks in a moment because of emotion, um, you know, or you whisper or, you know, it, this was the phantom for the screen. So you were allowed to be so much more subtle. I went into that character so deeply um, and, and much as it was beautiful and the sets were incredible and I was surrounded by the most amazing cast, you know, Amy Rossum, Patrick Wilson, Miranda Richardson, Simon Callow. I mean, are you kidding me? But I spent a lot of time really lonely and depressed. And, and kind of away from everybody and, and breaking my heart. My heart broke that whole movie for him, for the character that I was playing. Even now as I think about it, 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 it very um, emotional, but, but beautiful as well um, to, to, to feel that so strongly. And I remember as I would be singing and I would think, if one person connects with what I'm feeling right now, just one, all this will have been, all this will have been worth it. And um, uh, unfortunately, nobody did, but. Um, <laughs> you threaten my people with slavery and death. Oh, I've chosen my words carefully, Persian. Perhaps you should have done the same. This is blasphemy. This is madness. I felt like 300 was an amalgamation of so many of the roles that I had played. Um, with all their power and strength and darkness because I felt Leonidas also had a kind of twisted side to him. You had to be to, to keep that warrior ethos. When I first met with Zack Snyder, after having read the graphic novel, I was in. I'm like, oh, uh, and I remember being in a cafe with Zack going, and they're gonna walk like this and stand like this. And this is, you know, and, and, and he's like, yeah, yeah, let's, and he's jumping about. And, and then they showed me the test that they did. And, and that was the other producers I was meeting for the first time. And, and I remember I was taking this thing for training that I'd got from GNC, which made me, it was the first time I'd ever taken it, made me edgy. And I was so nervous. And then they show me this test shot and I jump up in the sofa and I'm like, this is amazing. This is fit. And then I walk out of there going, I blew that. I blew that. But it was the opposite. Each time they said, you know, this guy, he has so much passion and strength and connection to the role. But it, it still left me to have to call Alan Horn. I was left in this weird situation where they said, okay, if you, um, we don't want to put you forward. So we want you to call Alan Horn because if we put you forward and he says, no, it's going to damage your project. So I knew I was their man, but I had to call Alan Horn, who was the, the president, the, the chairman of, of Warner Brothers out of the blue. And then I prepared this speech about why I was Leonidas and why I would give everything to make him so proud of me and the job that I would do. And I felt it was my destiny to, to play that role and do justice to that man. And then the next day I got the call and when, whenever there's five agents on the phone, you know you're either in big trouble or something amazing has just happened. So I, I got the call and all I heard was, you got 300. And I was in some clock shop, Beverly. I don't even know why I was in a clock shop, but I'm not one that normally make, especially when I'm on my own, I don't make a lot of noise, but I'm like, yes, yes, I got it. <laughs> and then I went, oh, shit. I just told him I was going to be amazing. How, how am I going to pull that off? And that happens. It's so funny that you say, let me add this. I've got this. And they say, okay. And then you go, I don't know how to do this. I'm, what am I going to do? Um, again, healthy fear though, because I started training so hard and I tried to imagine what would a Spartan do and, and to train like a Spartan, to think like a Spartan, to eat like a Spartan. And, um, and I would even channel Leonidas and trust that all his strength and passion and, and, and discipline and courage and sacrifice was all inside me and would come out in whatever I, whatever I said, whatever I did, however I trained. And, and again, those I, just like in the Phantom, those ideas hopefully would transmit into the audience and they would feel the power of that man and what they did. 
Holly's my wife, by the way. My beautiful wife. And I do. I love Holly, I do. But she would never have the guts to do something like this. Oh, no. There was a lot of love on that set. A lot of kind of craziness, but in the sweetest way. You know, there was a lot of kind of like weird, but big hearted people there, and including me. And and I, I guess at that point in my career, I was flying. I was I was on a high and um, and it was lovely to go from a movie like 300 playing Leonidas into something that you couldn't get more different in Jerry Kennedy, you know, this Irish fellow. Hey, how are you? That's Jerry Kennedy. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember when I met Richard Legravenez, who became a dear friend of mine, um, I could just already tell how much heart and love was in this movie. And as I, as I went into the movie, every person that was involved higher up, Richard, it represented his friend Ted Demi. And, and one of the other producers representing her, her sister who passed away. And they all thought, and rightly so, that the story was their story and telling their story. And, and I feel like that's one of the reasons why the movie was so successful because it became everybody's story in accordance with what they had gone through um, in their lives. But I remember saying to uh, Richard when I first met him, I said, you know, I have this idea because as an actor, even if you're nice and you have a big heart and you're, you still go into a movie and you're thinking about yourself. How am I gonna do? Am I gonna, you know, and how do I kind of protect this role? And I said, I'm so gonna do the opposite of that here. I wanna go in and just think about Hillary and think, is she okay? What did you say, by self-forgetting that one finds? And the funny thing is, it really worked. I had such a great time in that movie because I didn't think about me all the time. I, I didn't, you know, I was really like always kind of checking, are you good, are you good, are you good? And it was a very interesting exercise, which as I'm saying this now, I go, I haven't done it enough since I'm back to me, 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 me. No. <laughs> but I didn't even realize what an impact that movie would would have, you know, even today, when I meet people that are like, oh my God, P.S., I love you all. <laughs> and they all tell you the story of what it, what it meant to them. Or once I was in Ireland and nobody knew I was there, I was in this bar. The movie had been out for about six months and I was in this dark part with a couple of friends and I went to the toilet and I had to go through the dance floor and as I went through the dance floor, Galway Girl came on. The Galway Girl's always been a popular song in Ireland, but it wouldn't fill the dance floor. Walking through that dance floor and they said, and now, yes, I love you, Galway Girl. Everybody jumped up and they're like, and nobody recognized me, I just kept walking. And I'm like, what do you do here? Did you stop and go, hey, that's, that's actually me. That's, uh, I sang that in the, but I, but I didn't, I kept going, but it was beautiful just to see the excitement that that generated in this, um, in this hotel bar. Napkin, Nick. Napkin. Oh, excuse me, waiter. You might want to put 30% down for yourself, my man. For 300, I won Action Star of the Year, and I just made my speech, and I came off um, the I came off the stage, and this guy approached me and said, "By the way, you're uh, you're maybe going to do a movie that I wrote." And this movie was called Edwin A. Salt. It later became Salt. It's such a great Hollywood story. It was a guy, then it changed, and suddenly it was Angelina Jolie. But at that point, I was in talks to make that movie. And, and I'm like, because at first I was like, oh, here we go. And I'm like, wait, you wrote Edwin A. Salt? Oh my God, I love that movie. What else have you got? He said, I wrote this other movie called Law Abiding Citizen. I'm, Get it to me, let me see it. And to be honest, the making of that movie was a bit of a mess. There was a lot of, Jamie was awesome. But trying to get that script right before we went, there was a lot of issues. The first movie we produced, it was a bit all over the place. Um, and there were too many cooks in, in the kitchen. Like, it was extremely frustrating. And I wasn't sure how it would turn out, but I loved the making of it. And I loved taking on that, that character. I was very surprised by how people tapped into the idea of vengeance if somebody hurts your family. And, and if you're not served justice by the law. 
because you are you're left castrated there and um, and then you go okay with that we can have so much fun like what does he do but i always felt in the movie by the point that he kills the ad's that the audience should say all right that's enough now we want him to die but the, it's a bit scary because they're like yeah that's okay he kills all those innocent ad's we still want him to live and i'm like um that, that was not really the way I pla that, that I thought it would pan out, but I love the way it panned out. It's amazing that you do these things and they start as a seed, an idea, a script that needs a lot of work. And then you walk around in the streets today and people go, Law abiding citizen, man. Again, it's, a, it's, it's, it's fun. It's part of why I love doing what I do. <laughs> Avi Lerner from Millennium Films gave me Olympus Has Fallen and another script that was, it was like a two-hander between a, a hitman and a cop. It was very funny, a lot of action. I liked them both. I literally couldn't decide which one to do. And I said, Avi, what, um, which one do you think I should do? And he said, you know, I don't know. You do whatever you want, but... But if you don't make, because they were making um, the, what was the other, uh, White House Down. And he said, if you if you don't make Olympus now before White House Down, we'll never make Olympus. So I thought, okay, let's make Olympus. And it was a big risk because it was a $200 million movie uh, being made on very similar subject matter by a very infamous director. The cast that we got on that movie, you know, Melissa Leo, Morgan Freeman, Angela Bassett, Aaron Eckhart, Dylan McDermott. And I look back, I'm like, I did not for a single second during filming think that this would be a franchise. I just thought it was a one-off movie. I thought it would probably bomb. I tried my best. I, you know, I, I loved making that movie, but I thought it would probably come out and get laughed at. And, um, and I'm sure some people did, but I was amazed how how it went down. People loved that movie. Hey, where's the explosion? I don't want to make as many action or disaster movies as I used to. And if I do, there has to be something different about it. But the second I read Greenland, I, I completely understood why this movie could be made and affect people. I, I'd never read a, a disaster movie like this that actually was so much more about humanity or rather being human and grounded and real and, and messy. And like when your lead characters, they forget things and they make mistakes and they take wrong turns. And as you would do in an emergency, you, kinda, you don't always get things right. Uh, the same way with really paying a lot of attention to how the, the society kind of decays around us and, and in such an interesting and diverse way. Some people are celebrating, some people are praying, some people don't care, some people are looting, um, some people want to help us, some people want to kill us. And as you go on this journey with a family that you know way more than you do in your typical disaster movie, you really climb into their complexity and their flaws and their struggles and their resentments and their awkwardness and their love. So you're in it now in this journey and you see everything through their, through their lens. And it just made this, this movie is so unusual because you really, it, you don't even feel necessarily you're watching a Hollywood disaster movie. You kind of feel like you're really in this and it's, powerful and devastating and scary and beautiful and touching and hopeful and um, it, it has it all and, and um, yeah, yeah, I just, I, 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 I knew we could make something pretty special. It's one of the joys of not just being an actor, but when you get a, a chance to play great roles, you know, it's, I remember coming up in the career when they go, Here's a script with all these great roles. We want you to play this tiny one. And, and suddenly they're like, here's a great role in the movie. And, you know, all this beautiful, you, you, suddenly you're, you're dealing with the best writers and, and, and fantastic directors. And you're around a, a, a cast that you couldn't possibly have dreamed of that are going to help lift you up. But right now, 
I'm good and I'm actually excited to get back to work. <laughs>